let's talk about the three lowest glycemic carbohydrates that you could possibly want to consume. If you're gonna go the carb route, you need to know about the glycemic index. So I'm gonna break down the lowest glycemic vegetable, the lowest glycemic fruit, and also one of my favorite lowest glycemic grains, if you really wanna call it that. But first, let's talk about what the glycemic index is, because it's really important that you know so you understand this video. You see, the glycemic index is essentially just a measurement of how long it takes the actual sugar that you consume to hit the bloodstream in the form of glucose. Now, a lot of people have always asked, how do they measure the glycemic index? How do they know what it is? Well, it comes down to utilizing a control first. So what they'll do is they'll give a test subject 50 grams of pure glucose. Okay, in like a solution form that's uptake really fast. So from there, they know this is how long it takes this person to absorb pure glucose. Then on a separate occasion, they introduce the food in question. So let's say they're testing a grain of some kind. Let's say they're testing just straight up wheat. Well, what they'll do is they'll see how long it takes that wheat to actually spike the blood glucose to the same level. And that's gonna give them an idea of what the actual glycemic index is. See, the glycemic index is broken down on a scale of one to 100 and anything from 1 to 55 is considered a low glycemic food. Anything from 56 to 69 is a medium glycemic food, and anything from 70 to 100 is a high glycemic food, meaning it reaches the bloodstream really fast. Now, all we have to really factor in and remember is that a glycemic index means how long it takes something to hit your bloodstream. So let's get down to the good stuff. This first one I want to talk about is asparagus. Yeah, asparagus is a starch. It's still a carbohydrate. People always think that vegetables are vegetables and shouldn't count towards your carbohydrate count. That couldn't be further from the truth. They are still starches, they still have fibers, they still have all kinds of things that are a carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, CHO, which is a carbohydrate. But when we look at asparagus, it has a glycemic index of 15, which is astonishingly low. And it's a great food to combine with other foods to bring down that glycemic index of those foods too. Now the reason it's so low is because it contains predominantly something that's called inulin. Inulin is a prebiotic fiber, which means that it digests so slow that it's not even digested until it hits the colon. People always think that all digestion occurs in the upper GI and in the small intestine. Well, not in the case of asparagus. See, asparagus is broken down by lactobacilli, the kind of bacteria that's in your colon, which means that you're getting a lot of prebiotic effects that are growing good bacteria as well. If you're someone that's ever gotten bloated when you eat asparagus, it's usually an indicator that you don't have enough lactobacilli in your colon. What does that mean? It means that you have an imbalance in your gut biome. I always say that asparagus is a tremendous litmus test to determine if you really have a disrupted gut biome or not. Okay, additionally, asparagus contains something known as racemofuran. Racemofuran is a particular antioxidant that acts as a COX enzyme. So it reduces inflammation, reduces pain but it can really reduce it at the source, in the gut. So you get a double whammy. You get a nice low GI carb, but you also get an anti-inflammatory effect. All right, now let's look at the fruit. Those of you that watch my videos all the time know that I'm not the biggest proponent of eating tons of fruit because it's metabolized differently. However, there are some ones that are decent. And in this case, I'm gonna talk about grapefruit. You see, grapefruit is a 25 on the glycemic index scale. Pretty darn low compared to a lot of fruits. Not the lowest, but still low enough. What's really cool about grapefruit is it contains something known as naranginin. Now, naranginin convinces the liver to utilize fat for fuel instead of storing carbs through de novo lipogenesis as fat. What does that mean? It means that grapefruit is a master manipulator. It knows how to go in the body and tell the liver to do a different job than what it was used to doing. So not only is it a low glycemic fruit, but it also ultimately helps you end up burning more fat in the long run. And to make matters better, it's been shown in studies that grapefruit is as effective as metformin when it comes down to reducing your blood sugar levels. Metformin is a drug that's given to diabetics to bring down their blood sugar. Well, grapefruit literally can bring your blood sugar down by 13%. That's pretty significant, especially if you have diabetes. All right, now let's get to the really cool one, the starch. This one's amazing because you can make a pizza crust with it, you can make pasta with it, you can make bread with it, and it's still super low glycemic, and it's known as buckwheat. Buckwheat is still a 25 on the glycemic index scale. Yeah, white bread is like a 97 to 99, so you can make some dang good bread with buckwheat. The thing about buckwheat, it's technically not even a grain or a wheat. It's technically a seed. And you see, it contains something very interesting, something really cool, known as rutin. Now, rutin does something intriguing in your body. 
it deactivates something known as platelet activating factor, PAF. That platelet activating factor does exactly what it sounds like. It activates platelets in the blood, signaling white blood cells to actually form a clot and to actually start an immune response. Well, what's really cool is that if you have this in a controlled fashion, like with buckwheat, you can reduce inflammation and you can reduce the clotting that can trigger more inflammation inside the intestinal tract. So much like asparagus, it has powerful anti-inflammatory properties. And when you have reduced inflammation in the gut, you get better absorption, which means you can control your insulin spike. You can control when those carbs work. And it's that much better. Now to make all this stuff make sense, I wanna make sure that you understand glycemic load. There's a big difference between glycemic index and glycemic load, just so that you guys know and have the facts. Glycemic load is more about how long it takes a carb to really do its job and how long it's in the system. So it's like the gentle bell curve. So for instance, glucose is going to have a very high glycemic index, but it's also going to have a high glycemic load because it's going to spike up really fast and go high really fast. Whereas if you were to combine glucose with say a fiber, it's going to balance each other out. That's going to decrease the load and make it so that the load is more of a bell curve. So that's the big difference there and that's what you have to factor in. So when we look at things like asparagus, we look at things like buckwheat that have additional fibers in it, that's the big reason why the glycemic load on those foods is so low. Now I'll do another video explaining that in the future. And as always, if you like videos on carb metabolism, fat metabolism, and even protein metabolism so that you can understand how the different macros are working in your body, you have to let me know. Let me know in the comments section. I do my best to go through and read all of those even if I don't get a chance to reply. So as always, keep it locked in here on the Thomas DeLauer channel, and I will see you in the next video.